Check. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. On behalf of RBCS and Software Test Professionals, welcome to this webinar on introducing the ISDKB Agile Syllabus. I am Rex Black, president of RBCS, a worldwide testing and quality assurance firm serving clients ranging from small startups to Fortune 20 global enterprises. Since 1994, we have delivered insight and confidence to hundreds of clients around the world. Our team of international consultants deliver customized training, consulting, and outsourcing services for companies that are looking to improve their test and quality assurance practices. I'm the author of 12 books on software testing, uh, including a number of books on the ISTQB program, and uh, who knows, maybe an upcoming book uh, describing the ISTQB's um, Agile Foundation syllabus. We're presenting this webinar in partnership with Software Test Professionals. You can check out their website at softwaretestpro.com. Just got back from the uh, STP conference uh, last night. The conference is winding up today. Any of you who are there listening to uh, this broadcast and they're, you're off time, I hope uh, the rest of the conference is going well for you. Attending today's webinar earns PMI PDUs. Thank you, Vicki Sasser, for uh, reviewing this material for PDU status and making valuable suggestions. Um, you'll receive an email telling you how to claim the PDUs um, if appropriate. Um, before we start the presentation, a couple of housekeeping notes. If you have any questions during the course of the webinar, please feel free to submit them throughout the presentation via your webinar interface. But please note that they are answered only at the end. Though I will be looking at some of your responses a little differently this time during some of the questions that we're going to talk about. So I will look uh, look at some of the things that you're you're saying to me during the middle of the presentation. But for the general uh, rule, questions will be t uh, answered at the end. Uh, you do not need to ask for presentation copies. The presentation is already on the web. It's at uh, www.rbcs-us.com. Navigate to the Resources tab in the upper middle of the page. From there, navigate to the Basic Library. You will find the uh, PDF version of the uh, slides uh, at that location. Um, you have been automatically registered just by attending this webinar for a free e-learning drawing, which will happen in the next couple days, so watch your email. If you're having any problems um, <clears throat> with the webinar, um, getting access to either audio or visual, um, I suggest contacting GoToWebinar support. Generally, the problems are either uh, browser incompatibility, so your browser doesn't work with GoToWebinar or doesn't work properly, company firewalls preventing the download of the GoToWebinar software, but of course you wouldn't be hearing me if you had that problem, and uh, audio settings on your PC can sometimes be problematic with the GoToWebinar software, so you might check that as well. Hope you enjoy this free webinar from RBCS. We do these as a service to the software testing community because at RBCS we are a not just for profit company. So um, today we will talk about the new ISTQB um, syllabus and uh, specifically that will uh, uh, bring us to the topic of uh, what's in it and uh, what are we doing with respect to uh, courses for it and um, other uh, related uh, topics. So um, ISTQB support for Agile just generally is, is something that has been um, true for a long time. There's uh, been a um, discussion in both the foundation and the advanced syllabi about um, Agile methodologies and the need to fit testing within the different methodologies. Uh, and that's been there for, for years. Um, and there's also discussion at the expert level and the expert test manager, for example, when it came out, it was one of the things that uh, uh, myself, along with my co-authors, uh, made sure to talk about was the influence of life cycle on the, uh, uh, on the uh, way in which software is, is not just uh, developed but also uh, tested. Um, now, the idea here with this new syllabus is to extend the foundation um, to add some complementary material that uh, goes into more detail um, with respect to uh, testing in an, in an agile, um, agile environment. Um, so 
the um, courses, if you if you decide to take a course, which of course you you know you don't have to, it's an ISTQB program. You can self self prepare for this. But if you do decide to take a course, it'll be two days, as opposed to the anywhere from three to five days that the foundation has uh, typically run in. We usually run our course in a four day format, but we also do offer it in three day, usually four. Um, the syllabus, uh, the, the new Agile uh, tester extension syllabus was written in uh, mostly in 2013. We're still polishing it now. Um, Tahita Parbeen and I are putting the, the finishing touches on it. We hope to have it um, released to the general public here in, uh, in the very near future, uh, sometime in, uh, in early May. Now, as we were writing the syllabus, one of the things that we were doing was looking at what are the established Agile best practices, um, one of the best uh, ideas that are out there with respect to Agile development and um, Agile testing. And also looking at what are established testing best practices regardless of life cycle that, and how do those uh, port over, if you will, into an Agile uh, methodology. So, um, you know, some people act as if Agile came along and, and changed everything. Um, and uh, it, it really doesn't. It, um, it affects everything in, in testing. It, it is, has an effect on the way that you do your testing, but it's still the, the same best practices apply. We just apply them differently. So let's take a look at what we've got here in the, uh, in the syllabus and look at some sample questions as well. All right, now this is the structure of the ISTQB program, so you can see where the Agile, um, Agile tester fits in. Let me uh, get the highlighter up here. So here's the Agile tester. Hmm. Uh, the highlighter does not want to work. Okay, the spotlight. So there's the Agile tester there. As you can see, plan for 2014, like I said, should be out here in the next, uh, oh, say, uh, month uh, or so. There's also another extension plan, which is model-based testing. Um, that's planned for 2015. Um, we'll see how that goes. Obviously, in terms of market demand, uh, Agile Tester uh, is, a, is um, by far the most important um, just to give you an example, we're, we're pre-selling our um, uh, virtual Agile Tester virtual course, and um, just within about a week of um, announcing it and advertising it, we've already got uh, 30 people signed up for it. So there's quite a bit of interest, quite a bit of demand. Um, <clears throat> now, the advanced fits above this, uh, above the foundation. Agile Tester will not be a prerequisite to take the advanced level. If the prerequisites for the advanced level will still be just the foundation. Um, but there is a possibility that at the advanced level, there might also be some Agile um, extensions that are, are added there with something that's being discussed now. So then in that case, the Agile Tester extension at the foundation level would be a prerequisite for the um, extension at the advanced level. And then you see we've got the, the expert levels here. And we are continuing to roll out that expert level. Um, so that's a you know that's that's something that, that uh, continues to progress. Um, okay, so let me get back to normal normal mode here in the uh, presentation. Um, so what um, what can you uh, expect um, to say take away from a um, agile tester uh, certification? What should a, a person who's um, got the skills in, inherent in, in the uh, agile tester foundation uh, syllabus uh, be able to do? Well, collaboration um, collaboration is a big uh, big part of Agile, and so in, um, in the syllabus there's a lot of stress on we'll work collaboratively uh, with the rest of the Agile team and no um, Agile best practices, Agile principles, be, be aware of those. 
so that you can actually effectively collaborate. You, you know what you're doing and how to fit yourself into the context. Um, be able to apply your existing testing skills, experience, knowledge, best practices in an agile setting. So know how to take what you, what you already know about testing, test design techniques, risk analysis, and so forth, move that into an agile environment. Um, participate in release and iteration planning, uh, figuring out what test strategies you're going to follow throughout each iteration, um, participating in estimating the testing effort associated with each one of the user stories and other uh, test-related tasks in each iteration, be able to uh, participate effectively that, in that, uh, those activities. Um, be able to apply the techniques that are appropriate to a given situation. So black box testing, white box testing, experience-based testing, be able to apply those techniques where appropriate. Um, Agile puts a great emphasis on automation, test automation, um, as do other life cycles as well. Um, and in an Agile environment, the tester is expected to be able to participate and contribute to this, um, this automation work. So be able to participate in that. Um, <clears throat> work with business stakeholders to help um, refine and define the requirements, um, often referred to as user stories in an Agile environment. Um, make sure that they're clear to yourself as a tester and, and to the developers and to the business stakeholders that you all agree on what they mean, and that there are defined acceptance criteria for the user stories so that you can recognize when, um, when a particular piece of code is actually done. And as you generate information, of course, is what we do as testers, share that information effectively and in a timely fashion with other people on the team. So those are the things that you should be able to do. It's, uh, sorry, I've been dealing with a little uh, Citrix real estate issue here. <laughs> um, all right, good, there we are. So what's in the syllabus? So the syllabus has three chapters in it, and uh, the first chapter is a general one on um, Agile software development. So it goes through the basic concepts of software, um, Agile software development, um, fundamental ideas, um, Agile manifesto, for example, and then different interesting aspects of uh, Agile approaches. And we, we picked out three um, there are many different agile agile approaches out there. Different types of agile. We picked three out to as as sort of examples and and to to represent some of the the different um, kinds of ways that people go about doing agile development. So we look at Scrum and Kanban and extreme programming. Um, we had a lot of debate about that. Um, you know, do we want to go broad or do we want to go deep? Ultimately, we decided you know it'd be better to go to be more in depth and provide some detail on a small sample of approaches rather than try to enumerate every approach that's out there. Um, so we picked those three as being you know, reasonably common, not by any means ubiquitous, but uh, certainly Scrum, Kanban, and XP are, are things that uh, are um, in, common, in, in relatively common use, uh, Scrum especially, and um, Agile practitioners tend to know about them. So. We figured it's good that testers be conversant in those. Um, and so that's at a high level. The general approach to writing the syllabus was to start at the highest level and then move down to providing more detail and more depth um, later. So there is sort of a, I, don't know, I guess appropriately enough, iterative <laughs> nature to the material where it gives a very high-level overview. And then as you continue on into Chapters 2 and 3, it goes into more, more detail and things that were introduced earlier. So the second chapter gets into um, principles, practices, and processes in, in uh, Agile testing. So now we're going from Agile software development in general to how testing fits into Agile. Um, so there's a section on um, sort of compare and contrast traditional and Agile approaches. So traditional approaches being the waterfall, uh, V model, 
approach and also the uh, iterative approaches such as rational unified process and uh, rapid application development. Um, so those are those are considered also to be traditional approaches. Um, but some people would say they kind of stand straddle the middle ground between agile and um, and sequential. So we do that compare and contrast, then move on into um, status of testing, um, how how test status is reported in um, agile projects, how how testing is managed, and then we look at the um, role that testers play in an agile team and the skills that they need to have. What what kind of skills do you have? How does agile change the the skills mix that a, a tester needs to have? And then finally, we get to the most specific of the chapters, the most um, down to the nitty gritty, if you will, um, of, of the chapters. And you'll see why I say that here in, in a bit when we go through the, the learning objectives associated with each chapter. We look at uh, different methods that are used in Agile for testing, um, the application of quality risk analysis to Agile and how um, test effort is estimated. Uh, different techniques that are used in, in Agile projects, and, uh, and finally, um, a brief discussion of, of uh, tools and how Agile um, makes tools even more important uh, for a tester in, in an Agile, uh, in, in a project. So, as I said, they start at the, at the top level here, in general, and broad discussion move on to focus more on testing, and then get to very specific um, in that last chapter. So whoops. So in order to, to understand that a little bit more, I need to explain something which you, you might or might not be familiar with, depending on um, whether you've taken the foundation already and also who, who you took your foundation course from, assuming that you took one. This might or might not have been explained to you. We, did, we explained this in our, our courses so that people get a better understanding. But um, what you see defined in the ISDQB syllabi, all of them, are learning objectives. Okay? And the learning objectives are at different knowledge levels. Uh, and basically, these, these learning objectives and the knowledge levels that they're at are there to say, okay, this is what we expect a person who's got this certificate to know and to be able to do to this depth of knowledge. And the three depths of knowledge are, the basic one is remembering, it's basic recall. Can you remember a fact, remember a technique, remember a definition? Uh, and then K2 is being, being able to actually understand something. You know, obviously you have to be able to remember something to understand it, but just because you remember something doesn't mean you understand it. That's why it's a more sophisticated level of knowledge. Uh, I mean, you might, you know, on remember, well, I'm going to give you an example. I, I remember how to read Cyrillic letters from taking Russian in college, but I don't understand Russian. So, I mean, I can, I can read out the words, but I don't understand what they mean. So I basically have K1 level knowledge of Russian. I remember how to read it, uh, like the, what the sounds are, but I don't understand what the sounds mean. Um, and then K3 is application, to be able to actually do something. And obviously you would have to remember and understand something to be able to do it, but just because you remember and understand doesn't mean that you, you can do it. Give you an example of that. I understand perfectly well how a piano works. Um, I understand the, the physics of the, of the strings and the, how the hammer striking the strings causes them to make sound and how there's a, a the wood in there, you know, influences the sound. Yep, yeah, totally understand that. Can't play a note. I have K2 knowledge of how a piano works. I do not have K3 knowledge of a piano. I can't play it. Now, at the foundation level, um, on the exam, 50% of the questions are K1. 35% um, are K2 and 15% are K3. And what you're going to see here in a minute is how we change the focus in this Agile extension um, to be much more um, hands-on and in-depth. 
I'll show you that here when we get into the exam structure. So um, if you look at the first bullet there, 40 questions, 65% or more to pass. Each question is worth the same number of points, two and a half points. Uh, okay, so far, that's exactly like the foundation. But look at chapter one, the 13 questions, and notice that more than half of those questions are K2. Um, there's only five K1s, and there's a K3 in chapter one. Now, moving on to chapter two, 12 questions, all of, all of, almost all of which are K2 questions. Um, and then you look at Chapter 3, which has 15 questions, the most questions of all. Half of those questions are K3. And the other half questions are evenly distributed, K1s and K2s. So there's only going to be 10 K1 questions, only 25%, as, a, as opposed to... Um, 50% um, in the um, in the foundation, uh, the basic foundation, and you have eight uh, K3 questions, so 20% uh, K3 questions. So it's just more more application and um, more understanding, more in-depth understanding. So this is a more challenging exam. So people should be. Be ready for that. Be prepared for that. The exam will challenge you in ways that the foundation exam really was was not as challenging. It's more, you know, recollection, it's memorization. There's less of that here. Now, you might be thinking, okay, great. Well, when can I take the exam? The ASTQB actually has two exams ready. Um, they are, they're waiting in the wings, waiting for the uh, syllabus to come out. So once the syllabus is released, the ASTQB will be ready to um, to run those. They have the exam, so you know, that's great news. Now let's look at these learning objectives. And what I want to do is go chapter by chapter through the learning objectives, and then give you a sample question for each one of these for for one of these learning objectives, just so you get a feel of what the questions might look like. So the first section in chapter one is, as I mentioned, about you know, what is Agile software development? One of the fundamental ideas. So you have a K1 learning objective here about the Agile Manifesto. So be familiar with what the Agile Manifesto says, what are the you know, just basic concepts of Agile, Agile development per the Agile Manifesto, which you know, pretty much sets, the, sets down what's common across all of the different uh, Agile approaches. And they are quite different. There are, there are a lot of significant differences between the approaches. Uh, it seems like what's happening is that organizations are starting to sort of coalesce into um, some, some fairly common practices that hybrid across the various different approaches and pick out the best parts of the, of the different approaches is what we're seeing with our clients. Um, now, next we have a K2 there, advantages of the whole team approach. Being able to work effectively, closely, in a collaborative way with developers and business representatives. Uh, taking testing out of the silo and embedding it within the, um, the team, the development team. And we'll talk about how you go about preserving independence, organizational structures that can be used to, to preserve independence a little bit later. And then early and frequent feedback, understanding early and frequent feedback. And of course, this is just um, Agile applying a fundamental principle of testing that you might remember from the foundation level, which is that early testing and quality assurance activities are very valuable. They save save a lot of uh, time and money. So Agile is uh, in many ways an application of that. So then we move on into the, the, the aspects of different Agile approaches. So we have a K1 here different Agile software development approaches. So as I said, it's Kanban, XP, and Scrum are the three examples that we're looking at, we're looking at there. And it's just a K1 learning objective. Just be familiar with them. We're not trying to teach you those three. It's just saying, you know, here's, here are three fairly common techniques that you may very well run across in your course of doing um, Agile testing. 
And we have a first K3 here, which is actually be able to create a user story, collaborating with development, the business representatives, and um, if you're in Scrum, a, a product owner. Um, so that's very important that testers be able to do that. We wanted to make sure that we had a strong emphasis on be able to define requirements collaboratively with business and technical stakeholders. Um, then we have a K2. Uh, it has to do with how, the use of retrospectives. Retrospectives are, are a valuable technique in any life cycle, uh, especially in Agile where they, they can be done frequently at the end of each iteration. It was just, uh, as I said, at the STP conference and uh, was one of the leaders of a, a, a expert roundtable on uh, Agile techniques. And uh, one of the things that we talked about was um, one, of the, one company was having trouble getting traction with their retrospectives. It was uh, what the uh, business stakeholder was referring to as the wine and cheese party, which was basically he, he would show up and listen to them, listen to the development team whine about things that went wrong and nothing ever changed. And, of course, that's, not, that's, that's exactly the opposite of what you want out of this process. So understand how to, how to participate effectively and how to utilize retrospectives for process improvement. Um, continuous integration. Continuous integration is something that's very important in Agile development and really is, is something that has been going on for years. I remember working, on a, um, working in an environment where we did monthly maintenance releases and um, code was checked in every day and, and run. There was a nightly... Um, set of regression tests that were run against. And really, looking back at that, so this is like early 1990s, looking back at that, we were already doing a lot of what ultimately would be called agile development. So these are ideas that have been around a long time. Continuous integration is definitely a best practice. So that's one of the uh, things that we have in the um, syllabus. And then um, iteration planning and release planning and how you can participate as a tester, how to add value in those. People will be familiar with that. So here is a sample question. And um, I'll let you take a look at this, give you a, a minute. And I'm going to, whoops, I'm going to get the Q&A panel up here. When you have your answer. Go ahead and submit it to me via the Q&A panel. You were submitting answers. Most of you have it right so far. I mean, just a few people are missing it, though. Trellis is asking, are you still on? I assume you can hear me. Um, all right, so the answer is A. All right, so as I said, a number of you got that right. As a uh, tester, um, you want to, to uh, work with the business and technical stakeholders to uh, help them understand um, what would be uh, ex testable acceptance criteria. Um, how would we know that something was actually uh, working properly? So... <laughs> Jim asked, do I win a prize? I'm afraid not, Jim. <laughs> there, 
we have no prizes uh, for, for this part of it, but you are in the drawing for the free learning, so it's, it's possible that you might win one yet. <laughs> um, so it says, at least not on the first question. Yeah, you, you have to, you know, it's, it's luck of the draw on the, uh, the e-learning uh, drawing, literally. Um, okay, so moving on to Chapter 2. Now, notice the first chapter, learning objectives, very high level, very general with the exception of the, the K3 one having to do with the, the um, testable acceptance criteria. Um, so the first, sub, the first section here talks about um, what's different in uh, audio, uh, traditional versus agile approaches, right? And again, traditional is sequential. Traditional is um, iterative um, life cycles like rational unified process and rapid application development. Agile includes the, the basically all the different life cycle approaches that call themselves Agile. Um, you know, XP, Scrum, Kanban being the three examples that we picked to look at, but, you know, Crystal and so forth would also be in, included in that. Um, so the K2 learning objective here, what's, what are the differences? You know, compare and contrast Agile and non-Agile types of projects in terms of what, what goes on in terms of with regard to testing. Um, now, coding and testing activities integrated in, in an Agile project. So you know, what's, the, what's the relationship between development and testing in an Agile project? How is that same? How is it different? And then um, how do we preserve um, independence and, and what kind of organizational options do we have to make sure that we still get the benefits of independent testing? Uh, in a situation where people are integrated within the um, the agile team, and does it should everybody be integrated within the agile team? The next section has to do with um, test status reporting. Um, two learning objectives here. One, how do we communicate test results, progress of, of testing, the quality of the product? What are different options available for us to do that? Um, and then there's the how do we evolve tests um, as iterations go on? How does test automation um, allow us to manage regression risk and provide information to people about how, what the level of regression risk is? It's very important in an Agile project because, of course, regression risk is going to be much higher due to the high rate of code churn that can go on. And then finally, roles and skills of a tester in an Agile team. So. Just a couple K2 learning objectives. What, what skills do you need to have? What is your role in a, as a tester in an Agile team? And we get into this in more detail in Chapter 3, too. We come back to it. As I said, you'll, in a, a recurring theme of the syllabus is to introduce a concept at a high level and then come back to it and add more detail to it as you go along. Okay, so here we have our next... Uh, Example question. So give this one a shot. This is what's called a Roman type question. Are you familiar with that because of the Roman numerals? Okay, so we got answers coming in a little, people are finding this one a little more challenging. I'd say most people are getting it right, but not everybody. Yeah, so the answer is C. Um, so 
notice that's saying the two and four are the correct are correct in terms of what the tester does and, and the rest are incorrect. So let's go through each one of these. Um, a tester does, <clears throat> well, let me just get the highlighter up here so see what I'm addressing. So a tester does contribute to defining the acceptance criteria in the user story, but ultimately the tester is not the one who makes that determination. Ultimately, it is the business stakeholder who's going to make that determination of whether the uh, particular feature is, is acceptable. Uh, obviously, tester in an Agile team, just like in any team, will design, create, and execute tests. That's a basic tester role. Uh, and by the way, you should notice that any, any of the options that didn't include two, which would be this back here, A, you could immediately exclude because that one is, is an obvious one. Uh, scheduling defect reports for analysis. No, we don't actually schedule them. Um, those the defect reports are going to be um, considered by the whole team, and the whole team is going to figure out when, um, what the priority is of working on those. Obviously, the um, tester contributes to that discussion, but the tester is not directing the developer, hey, you need to go work on that right now. Um, one of the concepts in an Agile team is that the team is self-directing, which means it, it decides collaboratively on what to do. It does not one person saying, you need to do this. Automation of tests, maintaining those automated tests, that's also something that uh, testers do. Now, you might have looked at this and said, oh, well, that's really mostly the developers, right, doing their test-driven development, using tools like JUnit and so forth. Well, no, they do that. That's true. But that's that doesn't mean that as testers we don't do automation as well. In fact, we're, we do. We're supposed to. And then this one should have been relatively easy to exclude. Um, Improving the program logic by pair program, and that is, of course, a developer activity, um, and that's something that the developers are working on. Now, I've got a question from Ivana here relevant to this question, which says, does component testing remain the responsibility of the developers? Yes, yes. Creating the unit tests is something that the developers would, uh, would need to do. They might use a technique like uh, test-driven development, which is discussed in the syllabus where the tests are written prior to the code, and then the code is written to um, make the test pass. Uh, so that, that is still something that, uh, that the developers do. But we as testers also need to be ready to participate in automation of, the, um, of our system level tests. Um, make sure that, that we have good regression mitigation, regression risk mitigation um, at, at multiple levels. And we talk about in the syllabus how to um, integrate those different levels, those different test levels into Agile because, you know, in a sequential environment, what happens is the test levels are basically used as, as gates uh, as, as the software moves through the from development into a testing phase, testing mode, um, you know, various levels of maturity. In Agile, those levels are not used as gates. The levels are going on um, in parallel and iteratively. So there's a lot of material in the syllabus that talks about how that, um, how that should work and what types of tests need to be run at the different uh, levels as, as part of the different activities. Okay, so... Most of you did pretty well on that one, but especially given that I'm not sure that any of you have actually read the syllabus yet. So <laughs> um, let's see what's next here. Learning objectives for Chapter 3. This is the first half, so notice there's two pages of this. Like I said, we're now getting really specific. So uh, here's um, the different... Um, uh, concepts of um, test-driven development, acceptance test-driven development, and behavior-driven development. That is something that's um, uh, laid out. Like, okay, these are the basic concepts. Now, we come back to that later um, and expect people to actually be able to do acceptance test-driven development. That's something that you'll see in a minute here. 
The test pyramid, this is where we're talking about the different levels, that and the test quadrants, and, and how those relate to the test levels and the test types, automation. Um, it's all covered there. And then um, notice here it's got the, the K3 um, role of the tester in a Scrum team. So we now are going to, using Scrum as an example, get very specific about the tester's role, whereas before we were talking about it more uh, generally. And we have a section, a very important section, on doing um, quality risk assessment and estimation in the uh, uh, testing, uh, estimation of the test effort as part of uh, release planning and iteration planning. So be able to assess quality, quality risks and be able to estimate your, um, the amount of testing effort required uh, based both on the, the iteration content, the user stories that are scheduled for this particular iteration, and the level of risk associated with those uh, stories. Oops. Now we have two more sections here, techniques in an Agile project. So um, be able to gather relevant information for your testing activities. We've got a K3 there. This is important because level of documentation is minimized in Agile. So what do you do in terms of getting appropriate information for your uh, uh, defining your tests and um, defining the expected results of your tests? What, are, what is pass versus fail? Um, again, coming back to working with business stakeholders on defining acceptable uh, testable acceptance criteria. So reinforcing that point that was brought up earlier in Chapter 1. As I said, now here's the K3 on acceptance test-driven development. Be able to create test cases using acceptance test-driven development. Pick that as an example. Um, uh, you know, one of the, of the techniques that's out there. Apply black box test design techniques to Agile projects based on a user story to cover both functional and non-functional aspects of the user story. So there's a, another K3. This is bringing over known testing best practices into Agile. And be able to do exploratory testing, exploring testing. So application of experience-based techniques in Agile. And then finally, a brief section on tools. Um, so just complementing what's in the foundation in Chapter 6, saying, okay, in addition to what was covered in tools in Chapter 6 of the Foundation, here's some other things that you need to know. And it's just a basic K1. You're just expected to have basic uh, recollection of that. All right, so I'll give you another uh, sample question here, last of our sample questions. Again, go ahead and submit the answer when you have it. Most of you seen the beginning of People are stumped by it, though. And the answer is C. Uh, now, um, <coughs> Some of you said A, and um, the problem with A is the, the statement, eliminate the potential impact. Okay? If you're looking at a risk item, 
what the programmers are able to influence is not the potential impact. What they're able to influence is the likelihood of a failure. But you're looking at something like system responds too slowly to user input during login and say that's your risk item. The impact associated with that is a function of how that failure manifests itself and how, how frequently that poses problems for customers, um, you know, what, what it does to the customers. Um, and that's not something that the programmer is going to be able to change. The programmer can change the likelihood of there being a problem. Um, D, we can eliminate because um, while certainly product owners or business stakeholders should consider um, rethinking a user story that has too much uh, quality risk associated with it, um, rejecting it, you know, that's not necessarily a good idea. It might be that this is something that you really, really need to do, um, and it's risky. And it certainly happens. So C is correct. Um, obviously, this is true in both Agile and non-Agile, that um, how much testing you need to do is a function of the level of risk. This was something that was stated at the foundation in Chapter 1 um, and then reinforced later in Chapter 5. Um, now, Jonathan says, well, it really should be B and C. That's why I say B for last. Um, I think what's wrong with B, Jonathan, is it's not so much that the scrum master can mitigate the quality risk prior to the start of programming. It's that the whole team can work together to try to mitigate the quality risk. But the scrum master, his, him or herself, uh, is not going to take ownership for trying to reduce the the, the, the level of risk uh, prior to the programming. So how would the, pro the whole team do that? Well, through things like um, working on the user stories to define them in a way that reduces the, the amount of quality risk. But notice that in that case, it's not the scrum master doing it. It's the whole team. It's the developer, the tester, and the business stakeholder for that particular uh, user story. Um, so, you know, this is a matter of reading this carefully and uh, realizing that this is not something that, that is, is the Scrum Master's role. And Heather says, that totally makes sense. Thanks. So, yeah, it's, B, B is a very, um, a very plausible distractor. That's the term for the, something, that, uh, a, an option in the, the ISTQB exams, which is, which is wrong uh, as a distractor. And the more plausible one or more of the distractors are, uh, the, the harder the question. Okay. Now Mercedes says, as we say in PMI, what is the best answer? Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so who is the um, who is the uh, target audience? What, what who do we develop the Agile extension for? Um, well, people who have worked as testers maybe for a while, maybe for a long while, maybe for years, but they've been working in traditional software development life cycles, and, um, and they uh, need to figure out how to transfer that knowledge over into an Agile world. They're starting to work on projects that are using Agile, or maybe their company is discussing using Agile, and they want to get a sense of, you know, okay, what does this mean for me? It's also perfectly suitable for people who are um, entry level coming into the uh, testing world and and um, either they, they will be working on agile projects or they want to be working on agile projects and they want to position themselves to be able to do that very effectively um, and we also wanted to make this suitable for developers and you know, no pre pre uh, presuppositions I guess would be the word about what the uh, Developers would know or how much testing they had done, but developers working in Agile projects who want to have a better understanding of what testing is all about on that project and maybe how to participate, collaborate more effectively in testing activities themselves, they're also considered um, potential uh, audiences for this certification. Um, now, at this point in time, it is required to have the foundation certificate to take the um, extension, the Agile extension exam and get the certificate. Um, if you think that's a bad rule, 
and you think that's a rule that we in the ISDQB should change, then uh, sound off about that. Send us send us some feedback. Um, you know, that's that's the current approach, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's always going to be the approach. So if you think that that's a dumb rule, um, let us know. Well, you know, the, the ISDQB uh, does listen to to feedback. Now, say okay, I'm 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 into it. Sounds good. What's next? So, take training if you want. Uh, it's optional. You don't have to take training to take the exam, but you know you can self study with books and so forth. Read the syllabus. Um, but we do have a training course. We RBCS. We have a training course that exists. We're like I said, we're running a virtual um, session of that uh, at the end of May, last week of May, uh, three day. Um, virtual course, uh, three and a half hours a day, three uh, sessions of that. Um, homework will be done. The exercises will be done as homework uh, after the uh, first and second session and then uh, debriefed. The, in other words, the solutions are discussed uh, at the beginning of the second and third sessions. So that's how we do it as a virtual course, as a live in-person instructor-led course. It's two days. And we're also going to be building out a um, uh, e-learning for that, um, which will be uh, something that we expect to have available, oh, July, August type of time frame. I think we'd probably be in a beta mode with that. Um, our live course, which is, again, either done live in person or via, or via virtual, that's already been submitted for accreditation. Uh, it's not yet been accepted for accreditation because the syllabus isn't out, so it's not the ASCQB is not ready to accept anything for accreditation yet, but we've submitted it, submitted the course. Now, in terms of what um, what you'll see in a accredited course, you'll have uh, lecture and real-world examples and exercises for all the K3 learning objectives. So it's going to be very hands-on. The courses will be will be hands-on. Now, our foundation course has always been hands-on, but I know there are training providers out there that are much more kind of brain cram type of courses. Um, that's not something that you're that that's going to pass muster uh, from an accreditation point of view, but you know all the courses will be different, so you want to look carefully at the different training providers and see what they uh, what they have to offer. Um, K two learning objectives, lecture, and again real world examples, and then the K one learning objectives are just explained in you know general lecture explanation in a few minutes. So, so I expect that there will be. Um, lots of options here. As I said, the interest has been intense in this. Uh, there's clearly a huge amount of pent-up demand. You've got about 300,000 foundation certificates around the world, and a large majority of those folks, when contacted uh, in a survey, we contact all 300,000, we sampled them, a large majority of the foundation certificate holders said, yeah, you know, we're interested in getting a Agile Foundation extensions uh, certificate, so I expect this to be a, a, a big deal going forward. Okay, so ISDQB has um, embraced uh, Agile from from the beginning, uh, and now we are expanding our coverage or extending our coverage uh, of Agile through these uh, extension syllabi. Um, starting off, we've got you know very short. Three chapters, 27 learning objectives at this foundation level, um, looking at how we can take the best ideas of testing and apply them within uh, within Agile projects. Uh, the exam will be harder. As, I, as you saw, it's uh, a lot less about just re remembering definitions. It's about half, half of that from the foundation, much more, you know, understanding things, being able to do things. So it's a uh, more rigorous, more hands-on type of exam. Um, as far as I know, we, RBCS, are the only training provider uh, currently, and uh, we hope to remain that way for a while, of course, but uh, I realistically expect that there will be uh, quite a few uh, options out there. Um, now, we do know that some of our Partners are most of our licensee partners are going to be interested in, in taking up the uh, our course and uh, 
we expect that it will be available in uh, in various languages fairly soon. I, I would expect that it will be available in Spanish probably within a month or two. So um, we expect very rapid take up of this, and um, you know we're we're all companies and boards are all positioning themselves. So the ASTKB has an exam, um, which I'm sure will be available very soon after the syllabus is formally released, which is sometime in the next month. So, exciting program. Um, it's uh, certainly a, it's a great idea. It's time has arrived in, um, in the uh, um, ISTQB uh, Foundation's extension syllabus is uh, um, going to really help, uh, help expand the idea of what professional testing is in, in an agile environment. So it's, it's very exciting. It's been exciting to work on it. I was the chair of the working group and uh, you know, we're, we're getting done here. I'm feeling a great sense of satisfaction in, in what's been put together. I'm sure when you get a chance to see it, you will too. All right. So as usual, I will put up the uh, Q and uh, the could the advertisement while I get the Q and A going here. And let's see, what do we got? Question. So Pedro asks, ISTQB Foundation training is a multi-day course. Um, is the Agile extension a one-day, or is it multi-day as well? So Pedro, um, yeah, as I as I said, it's two days uh, for an instructor-led live course, either an on-site or a public course. That's minimum time has to be two days. Uh, as a virtual course, we're able to do it in three half-day sessions. Eat three sessions each three and a half hours. Um, that's because in a live instructor-led course, the uh, exercises have to be done in the class. In the virtual course, what you do is you have the people go off, they do the exercises on their own, and then you come back and discuss them. Now, in order for to be an accredited course, you do have to have that discussion of the exercises. So um, a virtual course would have to be at least three days because you'd have to have two sessions that introduce the exercise. Remember, there are eight K3 learning objectives, so there are going to be eight exercises. Um, so, you know, with four exercises after the first day, four after the second, roughly, and then on the beginning of the second and the third day, you have to discuss the solutions, and that's required. So it, it has to be multi-day. Uh, might, might we do a one-day boot camp for it? Yeah, we probably will. Once we have our e-learning together, what we'll do is we'll give people access to the e-learning. Then the e-learning total running time will probably be about 10 to 12 hours of, um, of audio and sample question interaction um, plus a sample exam. So, you know, maybe maybe tops 15 hours. And then we would do a one-day, three-hour boot camp where we would just go through the syllabus um, section by section explaining the, the content. So we will probably do something like that. I don't know what other providers will do. So Maria says, what disadvantages are associated with Agile? Um, I did a webinar on that, Maria, called um, Agile Testing Challenges. And uh, what I would recommend is that you go take a look at that because this is a it, – it, that's it, what you're asking <laughs> – it's funny how sometimes a very short question, you know, in this case a four-word question, what disadvantages has Agile? Um, a four-word question could have a really, really long answer, <laughs> you know. Um, so rather than try to give a really short answer, I'll just say there are challenges, or there are testing challenges associated with Agile, especially when Agile is not implemented properly. Um, and... Uh, I would just say go out to the RBCS website, that's rbcs-us.com, navigate to the digital library um, from, from the resources tab, and um, then um, find the Agile Testing Challenges uh, recorded webinar and give that a listen. If you don't want to spend 60 minutes listening to it, um, then what you can do is you can find the slides, which are on the basic library, and you can uh, give those a read. All right, Jonathan says, um, do you think black box techniques should be more of a focus in user story development? Are you seeing groups push this info, test case identification, 
back to teams in agile environments to provide developers cheat sheets or scope. Um, so yes, I mean I think I I would say that if you're involved and you should be as a tester in in user story development, um, when the acceptance criteria are being defined. One of the things that, that you should be doing is immediately going into how would I design tests to cover this, right? That's the whole issue of the testable acceptance criteria. And so using black box techniques, absolutely. You know, uh, if there's some, you know, user story involves defining uh, a, a screen that accepts information. You know, you need to understand what are the valid and invalid inputs for each one of the fields on the screen. You need to know how to apply equivalence partitioning and boundary value analysis to those fields to be able to generate test cases. Um, if the screen, if the information in the screen results in particular actions being taken by the system or not taken by the system, then you need to think about well, how would I structure that in the form of a decision table. Maybe if it has an influence on the state of the application, you're thinking, hey, what's the state transition diagram going to look like? And so I think that's very helpful to um, include that. Now, you know, one of the principles of Agile is to try to uh, minimize documentation. And, and it's funny how that's seen as like, oh, that's, that's an Agile idea. Actually, I think that's always a good idea, right? I mean, the, the time spent documenting something is time not spent doing other work. So, you know, your, your documentation should always be, as a tester, what's the minimal amount of documentation that I need to do in order to support my, my task, to do my job properly. So certainly in Agile, that's explicitly stated. So, you know, you might, instead of like defining a test case that's documented to a great level of detail, you might just draw a picture of the equivalence partitions, the boundary values, maybe a decision table, maybe a state diagram. And, you know, somebody who knows how to um, create tests from those kinds of models doesn't necessarily need to have a full-blown, you know, concrete test case written. Um, Sharisa says, I am based in the UK. Do you have anyone doing the instructor-led courses in the UK? We will. Yes, we, we are uh, currently finalizing work with a licensee in the UK, we hope to be able to announce that partnership and how they're going to go about running tests uh, very soon. Baba Tundi asks, um, what is the cost for this training and the certification exam? Now, I don't know what the cost is going to be for the exam yet, Baba Tunde. That's not been announced by the ASTQB. So I would just say that I would expect it to be uh, in the two hundred to two hundred and fifty dollar range, that's what I would I would expect. Um, as far as the training, um, we do have costs um, on our training, and I want to avoid misspeaking here, quoting a number that is wrong. So what I would I would do is refer you to our online store. That's rbcs-us.com, um, and go to the store tab there and um, the, the training is, is posted there. It will be different costs um, for live instructor led versus e-learning versus the virtual courses so that we'll have those those different options available. Um, Ivana says will recordings of the course be available? Well uh, yeah if you take the virtual course the Recordings will be available to you afterwards uh, for a, a period of time. Um, once we get the e-learning up, what will happen is, since the, that's basically going to be the same thing, and then what will happen is that people who take both the virtual course and the live course will have access to the e-learning to be able to revisit things. Brian's got a great question here. I have a foundation certificate from 2007. Am I still eligible for the Agile add-on? Um, the foundation certificates are good for life, Brian. You do not have to retake them. Um, so yes, absolutely, you meet the you meet the prerequisites. Now that said, um, 
2007, you probably took the exam against the, I'm thinking probably the 2005 version of the syllabus, which is probably what was active at that point in time. Um, given that, given the uh, that you took it against a, a fairly older version of the syllabus, uh, it would be wise for you to reread the foundation syllabus, the current version, uh, 20, 2012 version, um, no, sorry, 2011 version, and um, make sure that um, you're clear on those concepts because it, the, the Agile extension does indeed extend the foundation, so you, you will be looking at questions that involve using black box test design techniques, for example. So, you know, make sure you refresh your memory. <laughs> so Carlos says, thank you, Rex. Always good to hear your webinars. Keep up the good work. I want to be like you when I grow up laughing out loud. Uh, so, well, <laughs> it, it, it's, um, thank you for the compliment, Carlos. Uh, <laughs> Maybe maybe when you're a, you're a viejo like I am, you'll uh, you you too will be uh, just like me. But uh, hopefully that's that's many years for you. But yeah, thank you thank you for the the, uh, the kind words. Um, okay, I'm going to mispronounce your name. I, I'm I'm thinking it's it's Hella um, Hella Jensen. Um, if I pronounce that right. Uh, uh, and all credit goes to my my Danish grandmother. Um, <laughs> if I did it wrong, then you can blame the English side of the family. Um, so Hella asks, uh, can certification as an agile tester organized by the firm Sujeti, which is a just parenthetically for those in the United States, is a large consultancy, um, uh, is very prominent in uh, Europe. It's also here in the United States as Cap Gemini. Uh, can certification as Agile Tester organized by the firm Sujeti be converted to ISTQB Agile Tester, or is it the same? Uh, okay, so I'm assuming that you're either talking about CAT, which is the Certified Agile Tester course, or maybe Sujeti has their own um, proprietary course. Uh, Either in either case, no, that certification is not recognized as equivalent. Um, when when we were developing the syllabus, we looked at a lot of different sources of ideas, and and that was one of them. But it is not; it's not; they're not the same. Uh, now. Have you already probably learned a lot of what is in the the, the extension syllabus and uh, um, you know from taking that course probably tr probably so um, and it probably would be possible for you to self study um, or you know take a, a less expensive e learning or virtual course rather than take a full two day training. Um, Maria asks, will we be able to take the advanced test manager without the Agile tester certification? Yes, Maria, that is, that is definitely uh, um, true. The uh, Agile extension is not a prerequisite for the core advanced, the three core advanced uh, exams. Now, that said, if there is an, an advanced Agile extension one or more such um, exams um, and syllabi ultimately defined, the foundation extension would probably be a prerequisite for that. Um, oh, Hella says that I did pronounce her name correctly, so there you go, that's great. I want to thank my, my Danish grandmother. If only she were here to, to know. Uh, and she says, yes, cat. So cat. CAT is, um, just for a little more information, CAT is a certification from a, um, um, well, the, the exam and the certification come from a uh, European-based entity called ISQI, I-S-Q-I, International Software Quality Institute is what I think that stands for, but I'm, don't hold me to it. They, they administer the exams. The training 
is created by a company called Diaz and Hilterscheid, and um, CAT uses the same kind of model that um, CMM, uh, the Software Engineering Institute uses for CMM training, CMMI training, which is everybody has to license the training from Diaz and Hilterscheid and uh, use their their training. Um, and so that that actually was was yet another reason why CAT's not a recognized ISTQB. You know, we didn't go that path of just recognizing it because that model is not permissible within the ISTQB program. It have to the training has to be open to anybody to create it, um, and that that wasn't the model there. Um, so we decided to develop our our own, and we did, and you know, we were able to. Uh, I think make some some improvements for that. Um, Ivana here said something for attendees. I'm sorry, Ivana. I'm not. I'm missing some context here on this. Um, maybe I missed part of your question. If you could resubmit the question, I'd be happy to to try it. Uh, Jim asks, will the three half-day training in May qualify for PMI PDUs? Do, 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 do. Um, the, it, the answer is not currently no, um, but that's an interesting idea, and there's no reason why we couldn't. Um, I'm, I mean, you know, if we have, if, if somebody wants to volunteer, somebody who's got PMI um, certificate, because I believe this is the way this works, any, anybody with PMI certificate can review the material. Um, if somebody wants to uh, take on that, that little adventure of being the reviewer, uh, PMI reviewer, um, uh, let me know. Um, um, you know that is probably something that we'll be able to get worked out. I would think if, if, if you, you know, whoever volunteers is, is willing to work fast, something that we could get worked out between now and, and May. Um, Ivana says you already answered before. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Ivana. Sorry if I was um, being dim-witted there. Uh, Follow-on question from Jim. Will the Agile extension syllabus be published and certification exams available after the May training? I assume so, but just want to check. Uh, yeah, it should be almost certainly out by then. Um, I say almost certainly just because we're, we're finalizing work on it now. Um, we're going to put it out for a vote. I'm expecting like mid-May would be the the actual formal release date. Uh, we want to make sure we get it right, but you know, I would say that that's it's mid-May when the syllabus and the when the exam will be uh, out. Um, Jim says I'd be happy to review, but not sure of the process to grant it uh, PMIable. Um, we do that for our webinars all the time, Jim, and there's, there's some people who who um, often do volunteer to um, do the reviews. And I, I understand that the process is not terribly complicated, and I think Laurel could actually explain it to you. So if you're if you're game for for doing that, Jim, uh, please let Laurel know, and um, we'll we'll get that we'll get that going. The thing that probably the thing that very much might be the case with this is that. I, I suspect that it's not going to count for a full 16 hours of, of PDUs because there's some stuff, there's some material in it that's not really man, management focused and to be PMI accredited or PMI recognized, um, you have to, uh, it has to be management focused. So it's, you know, this happens with like your foundation courses that way that it's not, you don't get uh, four days worth of PMI. Uh, PDUs for the foundation course. You just get a, a couple days, I think, for the management portions. Um, Diane asks, will it qualify for QAI learning hours? Uh, I do not know the answer for that. Um, I don't know what exactly the requirements are. Um, I have been told that people have successfully submitted attendance um, 
emails from us for our webinars to QAI and gotten credit that way. So I don't see any reason why this would be different, but I'm not QAI certified. Um, I don't know exactly how their process works, so you need to check with them. Okay. Um, so it seems to have wound down the questions. Um, so to close this session out, a little bit more about the resources that are, that are available. Um, we run these free webinars once a month, so check our website, rbcs-us.com, to sign up. If you would like a special webinar presentation for your company only of this webinar or on any other topic related to software testing, send us an email, info at rbcs-us.com, or just use the contact uh, form on our website. If you don't already receive our regular free newsletter, sign up at rbcs-us.com. Signing up will get you valuable discounts on consulting and training services along with a regular newsletter that includes a featured article on software testing and quality and news about what RBCS and its partners are doing lately. Uh, we are on Twitter. Handle is RBCS. And we're on Facebook, RBCS-INC. Uh, do uh, remember to check your email over the next couple days. You could be the lucky winner of the free e-learning course. Uh, you were registered uh, simply by signing up and or simply by attending this, uh, this free event. Um, check out our digital library. This, uh, the recorded versions of the webinars are there, that's, as well as podcasts and videos. Uh, this webinar, if you're thinking, oh, somebody, I know somebody who's going to be interested in this, they'll be able to listen to the recording of this webinar on the digital library here in the next couple of days. Or alternatively, they can attend the 8.30 session tonight. Um, you can subscribe to our podcast via iTunes and our RBCS podcast into the search string and uh, or see the videos and recorded podcasts by subscribing to the RBCS channel on YouTube. Um, we offer these free resources as a service to the software testing community because at RBCS we are a not just for profit company. Briefly before I conclude the webinar, I want to correct a, a mistake that I made at the offset. This webinar is actually not a PMI PDU webinar. Um, Sorry if that was a, a point of confusion. I was using an old intro script that happened to mention that, so apologies for that. This concludes the webinar. I would like to thank everyone for joining us today and look forward to seeing you on future webinars.